Let's go back in time to buy a house. In 1983, I'm an average person looking to buy an average house. I got this average degree, which I got for free, and work an average job. After paying tax and rent, I have... If I save 50% of the remainder, it will take me two years to save up for the 20% deposit. Remember that as we head back to 2023 and I'm still an average person looking to buy an average house, oh no. got this average degree, oh no. and I have an average job. Oh no. After paying tax, rent, and hex, I have... Oh no. If I save 50% of the remainder, it will take me 10 and a half years to save up for the 20% deposit. It's clear that it's not just lazy, layabout young people sipping latte. That's causing the problem. It would take me 84 years to save up enough money if I skip having a latte every day just for the deposit. I don't have 84 years left. In 40 years, the average house price has increased by 14 times, whereas full-time salaries have only increased by 4.7 times. Another way of looking at it is, houses used to cost three times the salary, and now they cost 10 times. All things being equal, you'd have to be making $300,000 a year to benefit from that same three times ratio. You might be thinking $90,000, wow, that's high. It is. That's because CEOs and vice chancellors taking home millions inflate the total pool of income and skew the average height. If you look at the median, that is the figure in the middle of all figures, that's around 48,000. So if you're making more than that, you're making more than 50% of all working people in Australia. And still, housing is so far out of reach. There's something bigger in play here. Why is the housing market so cooked? We need to go back in time. 1945, the world is rebuilding and those who served in World War II are returning home. The population is booming, but there's a shortfall in housing supply. So Governments are investing in the construction of public housing and infrastructure, creating jobs and affordable homes for those who need it. Making up a whopping 26.1% of all new dwellings being built. Publicly owned and operated assets are stabilizing the market for generations, keeping private dwelling costs down thanks to the competition they provide to private developments. Those lucky enough to survive the war have put their lives on hold for the good of their communities. Sound familiar? So ensuring the basic needs of the people is the least that governments could do, right? Right? Remember this is we pop by the 80s. A new economic theory has taken over the developed world. A higher power has captured democracy. Big business. Conservative leaders like Thatcher and Reagan. And even progressive leaders like Hawke are in love with neoliberalism use the world as economies first and society second, which is minimizing the role of government and removing safeguards in the belief that free, unregulated markets are more efficient, <coughs> profitable. Homes become investments. People become resources. Policies become business plans. So back to 2023 and 40 years of neoliberalism has created staggering inequality. Like, holy hell. In Australia, 93% of the economic growth is pocketed by the top 10% compared to the 50s and 60s, where 96% of the growth went to the bottom 90%. How are we meant to compete with that? Democracy is now pay to play. The people with the deepest pockets now design our policy, not the politicians. Successive neoliberal governments from both sides of politics have defected their responsibility to plan for the future, instead opting to make a quick buck from the sale of our assets. They've sold off public land, roads, air, education, rail, communications, banks, energy, water, natural resources, health, and housing, and leave us to squabble over which generation is to blame. I'm a boomer. Stop boomer bashing. I do you agree with you? As much as I've done that myself, I'll admit. All the while, the cost of living continues to grow and so do profits. And the revolving door between politics and big business continues to spin. We're in a housing crisis, yet the government is only committed to building an average of 4,000 new affordable homes a year. If we built at the same per capita rate as we did in the 60s, it would be 150,000. The neoliberal experiment has failed. Let's go to the future to buy a house. It's 2033 and I'm an average person with an average shop looking to buy an average house. But to pay rent and tax, I have... And if I save 50% of the remainder, it'll take me 15.4 years to save for the deposit. But wait, isn't this meant to be the solution video? Well, yeah, this is where things could get if nothing changes in your present. If the trend we saw from 2013 to 2023 continues, wages will only increase by 16% or houses will increase by 57% over the next decade. But what if they do? We need to go to the alternate future to find that out. In this future, 60% of all people live in public housing. It's high quality, affordable housing for all. Nurses, teachers, tradies, and all sorts of workers, young and old, live here. And they're never kicked out even as they earn more. Rent is 20 to 25% of income, and the projects are scattered around the whole city, meaning it's possible to live close to where you work. Sounds too good to be true, right? Well, it's not, because this already actually exists in the world. This is Vienna and it proves a great solution to the housing crisis, demonstrating that public and private interests can work together to create affordable and livable cities. To get anywhere close to 60% public housing is gonna take a seismic shift in the way that we view housing. So how do we fix the housing crisis? Housing needs to be defined as a human right, just like education or healthcare. Step one, housing levy. Step two, abolish capital gains and negative gearing. Step three, spend $500 per resident per year on building and maintaining public housing. Step four, acquire vacant residential and commercial properties. Step five, cap private rental increases. Step six, limit number of 
investment properties to three. Step seven, vacancy levy for holiday rentals. Step eight, tie immigration to available housing stock. Step nine, compensate first home buyers who have negative equity. Check out the glossary in the comment section for any terms you don't understand. Are we going to be able to do it in the next 10 years? Probably not, but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't start. But how do we start? Well, it's going to take some political will. So I'm heading to the place where that political will is meant to be housed. I emailed the Prime Minister, but no one replied to my emails. Except for one person. I snuck into Parliament House to talk about fixing the housing crisis. Thanks for meeting me, Max. It's clear there's a massive problem. Yeah. Why isn't the government doing anything about it? Because banks and property developers make massive profits off this housing system. The top 1% own 25% of investment properties. For those top 1% who end up donating a lot of money to the major parties, well, it works for them. Really, the major parties don't really want to change that. Josh, thanks so much for having me. Why, like, affordable housing? Why put the money in private hands? to operate and to build rather than keeping it within the public coffers and making a return on that investment? It's a really fair question. The simple answer is you get more homes. If you have also private capital investing in the construction of homes, then you can build more. I just don't know if 30,000 homes is the, is the difference. It's not. We need to do more. We, but we, you know, we need to also get back in the, in the, yeah. in the game. My electorate is the seat of Fowler. I know, I'm aware that I think there's about five to 6,000 people on the waiting list for social housing. Even if they did deliver on the 30,000 houses, it will not be enough. It feels like we're very powerless in this discussion. What can we actually do? That powerlessness and that feeling of it is crucial to maintaining the current system. Like one of the things you'll notice politicians do all the time is tell you there's not much you can do about it, we're doing everything we can. What they're actually saying is we hope you keep thinking that. Get informed and then get active and talk to your local politicians. I know you reach out to them and tell them what you think um, because they need to hear how important this is to you and they also need to hear what are some of the solutions that you think are also going to be worth considering. For those that are sceptical that they'll ever hear back, do MPs reply back to... I <laughs> say, so, you know, a lot of what I do is, uh, like myself and others in my team do, is reply to emails and I notice, I look every single week what are the emails I'm getting and what are the issues that people are raising with me and I you know take it to heart. It feels like we're in a crisis and it feels like radical solutions fix a crisis not like measured solutions because but like enough. you have to really have really massive ideas to fix a really massive problem and this doesn't feel like it. Uh, and, and, spend 10 billion dollars on housing. We are. Now. No just yeah, do it. Yeah. Just do it. Uh, look I, I, I hear you and I would just say that like for 10 years, we had a federal government who refused to do anything. Yeah. We've got to change that. We've got to step forward. We've got to do something. And, and once that's in place, once we've got the infrastructure to actually get this thing moving, to build homes now, stop squabbling, but just like make a start, then we look at, well, what's next? And how do we build from there? If we're serious about getting change, that means getting our heads down and realizing the people that we're fighting uh, are not going to fuck around and they have an enormous amount of wealth and power and pushing back on that is going to take time. Wow. Cool. Well, you heard it here first. The solution is more houses, right? More public houses. More houses. <laughs> Build them. Build it and they will come. The housing crisis is a political choice. Let's go to the politicians that can actually do something about it. It's not just politicians that roam these halls. There's another player in the game, big business, who donate millions to the major parties. Why? So parties can fund their election campaigns and get into or stay in government. But what do the donors get? Well, just ask PwC, who in the last decade donated $2 million to the major parties and awarded $420 million in government contracts. That's a 2,000% return on the investment. Cool, but what does this have to do with house prices? Well, in some states, donations from anonymous sources and property developers is illegal, but not federally. Considering that 35% of all political donations come from unknown source, dark money, it's really hard to tell if their political decisions aren't bought by their donors. So if they want our trust, these kinds of donations should be illegal. Otherwise, the revolving door between big business and government continues to spin. I should get an Oscar or something for that shot. Even without the influence of private interest, they have their own private interest because most MPs own multiple investment properties. How can we trust a building full of investment to make decisions for our best interests, not theirs. It all comes back to the neoliberal idea that housing is a way for some people to make a lot of money and not a basic need for all of us. This building behind me is a perfect example. The infamous Sirius building. The luxury $20 million apartments are now all but sold. And they used to be public housing. Where elderly long-term residents were removed to make way for the uber rich. And the privatisation of public property keeps happening. We're in a housing crisis, yet this public housing sits all but empty. Make it make sense. Public housing is being sold to the highest bidder. And with the waiting list for social housing growing, the question's been asked, where do these people go? Unfortunately, the answer to that question is just across the road. There's about 20 homeless people living under the tram lines. With current policies, we can really only expect more to join them soon. Welcome to the Hilton.
Well, my name's Stuart Chichabin. I've been here uh, 11 years now, this August. No excuse to be homeless this day and age, but it's there. <laughs> this is going to be uh, a rich area. So what does that mean for the people that aren't as lucky? They can't buy into it. People are too greedy. I'm not saying you got to talk to the politicians. What I'm going to tell you to do is talk to people that do something. Look how rich is going on across the country. I'd love to invite you and anyone else down who'd be keen. Remember that mind map from the start? There's someone even more powerful at the top of it. More powerful than the government, big business, even the constitution. It's you. When it comes down to it, boils down to it, you are the one that makes that decision. You. And together we can build economies and systems that work for us, not the other way around. We get up again and we fight, all right? And we won't get somewhere.